Welcome to the General Chemistry Exam 2 review. <clears throat> it's Steve Sinclair, and uh, we'll go over some questions related to Exam 2. Uh, first one, physical properties include all the following except. So you have uh, boiling point, odor, and specific gravity are physical properties, and when it's chemical is its reactivity with other substances, uh, which uh, is a chemical change. Um, we have uh, water freezing is a phase change, which is physical. You have alcohol evaporating, which is a phase change. Ice melting is a phase change. So the only one that's uh, chemical is uh, iron rusting. <coughs> you have uh, number three, which is a physical change. You have uh, kerosene burning is chemical. Uh, decomposition of water by electrolysis, chemical and electrical. Uh, converting alcohol to vinegar, chemical chemical change. Uh, salt dissolving in water uh, is a physical change. Uh, it's still salt. It's in water. You taste it. It has the same properties, has the same uh, effect on your body as uh, solid salt does. It happens to be in a solution. Uh, four, uh, give you the answers. Uh, unfortunately, that one, not enough people got this one right. So we're gonna, we're not, if you got that one wrong, it was not counted against you. But uh, which is a phase change, which phase change releases energy? So when you go from a liquid to a gas, it takes energy in to become the gas. Uh, so that, that takes energy in. Uh, solid to a liquid, once again, you take energy in from the solid to become a liquid. You know, when, when ice melts, it takes energy to do that. And so that takes energy to do that. A liquid to a solid, however, releases energy. And so when you have that liquid, liquid water, and it becomes a solid, it releases energy during that process. Uh, so that is then um, a release of energy versus taking energy in. And then a solid to a gas, uh, that sublimation, that direct, uh, like what carbon dioxide does, uh, going directly from a solid to a gas, takes energy to do that. Uh, it takes heat energy in in order to move those molecules faster. So uh, that releases energy, that uh, takes energy in. So uh, C is the answer there. Uh, that's the only one where there's a release of energy. <coughs> uh, five, uh, you have a 400 gram sample of water is at uh, 30 degrees Celsius. How many joules of energy is released to raise that temperature uh, of water to 45 degrees Celsius? Um, so in general, you know that your heat um, is going to be uh, mass times specific heat times temperature. You have that information. Um, and so then you go through the process then of entering those numbers. Uh, you have uh, 400 grams um, is that uh, amount of water. Um, you know the specific heat. You have That was one of the things I asked you to memorize was specific heat of water, which is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius and then you have that change in temperature final temperature uh, 45 uh, minus that initial temperature uh, which was uh, 30 so that temperature change that difference um, is uh, that uh, going to be that 15 degrees so you have 400 uh, times the 4.184 times 15 uh, gives you the uh, 25 uh, 1,104 uh, joules, uh, which is then, with significant figures, uh, 25,100. So let's see and get your answer there. Uh, six, uh, we have then the uh, 400 grams of a metal uh, absorbs that uh, thousand uh, 10,000 joules of heat energy, and its temperature then is raised from 20 degrees Celsius to 100 and three degrees Celsius was the specific heat of the metal. Um, so that's where you have to then use that and solve for specific heat. So you have the original um, heat equals the mass times speci specific heat times change in temperature. You then solve um, for specific heat um, and then that equals then uh, the heat uh, divided by uh, the mass times the change in temperature. So then you can use that equation then uh, to then solve, you have the heat on the top, that 10,000 joules. Uh, you have the amount, uh, which is the 400 grams. And then you have that final temperature, T final. Uh, once again, is always minus T initial, unless, of course, it's a heat transfer. Talk about that a little bit later. 
Uh, so then that, that change in temperature then becomes the 83. Um, and then you have uh, 10,000 uh, divided by the 400 times 83. And that gives you uh, uh, 0.3021, uh, which is then uh, for significant figures uh, 0.301 joules per gram degree Celsius. Uh, barium iodine contains 31% uh, barium by mass. What's the mass of iodine that is contained in 8 grams of barium iodine? Um, so you have uh, assume then uh, for 100 grams, um, it could be any amount, it's just 100 is easiest to use. Um, so for 100 grams, 35% of that, 35.1, uh, is the barium. Um, so then the difference what's not barium um, is iodine so that's the 64.9 percent uh, so then you multiply the mass of uh, the sample that 8.5 grams times that percentage um, and then you get then the grams of uh, iodine so it's that 5.5165 grams uh, which then uh, rounded up for significant figures is that uh, 5.52. All right, number eight. Uh, we have a specific heat of aluminum is uh, 0.9 joules per gram degree Celsius. How much energy is required to heat uh, 45 grams of aluminum from 20 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius? Once again, we're using our uh, specific heat equation. Heat equals uh, the mass times specific heat times temperature. So then you put those in, um, you have the mass, which is 45 grams, you have specific heat, which was given, which was the uh, 0.9 uh, joules per gram degree Celsius, and then you have the temperature change, T final, uh, minus T initial, uh, that ends up being 30 degrees, so you have the 45 uh, times uh, 0.9 times 30, uh, which is the uh, 12, uh, 1,215, uh, which then rounds for three significant figures to uh, 1220 joules. Number nine, uh, you have the uh, 12 grams of copper combined with iodine to form uh, 36 grams of copper iodide. What is the percent mass of copper in the copper one iodide? So then you know uh, that you have 12 grams of the copper that was given up here. Um, and then you have um, that becomes then the 36 grams of the copper iodine. Uh, then you then take that ratio, that 12 to 36 ratio, uh, and then times it by 100 to get the 33%, uh, 33.3. Um, and so then that's the percentage uh, of the copper iodine that is copper. Uh, 10. Uh, what is a, a chemical property of uh, chlorine? You have um, the uh, sharp odor, physical, the yellowish color of the gas, physical, the boiling point, physical, and then the, when it combines to form something, the combination is your key there that makes that chemical. So that's D. Uh, an example of a chemical property, uh, TNT is explosive. Uh, explosion is a reaction, so that is uh, chemical. Um, gasoline is flammable, it burns, so that's a reaction, that's chemical. Um, and then uh, zinc reacts with uh, hydrochloric acid to produce, that's a reaction, so then D, all of the above, because they're all chemical properties, because they're all reactions. Um, according to the law of conservation, energy can be neither uh, created nor destroyed. Uh, it can only be converted from one form to another. Um, so it cannot be. So energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So energy can be converted from one form to another. So that's the answer there. So it can't be created, can't be destroyed, can't be created nor destroyed. So that's the answer there. Um, you have uh, number 13 there. where you have the potential versus kinetic, so the top of that uh, graph, it's hard to see there, but that graph you, says potential energy going up, that says potential energy, so there's more potential energy in the top and more kinetic energy, or energy of motion on the bottom. 
So then when you have uh, that process then of the change, potential energy over time, it's going from potential down to um, kinetic. And so um, when you have uh, a solid, like uh, chocolate, uh, melting, so you have a solid to a liquid, um, it then takes heat to liquefy that, so that's a kinetic to potential change. Uh, boiling water, you have a liquid to a gas, um, heat uh, goes into gasification, so then that's a kinetic to potential change. Um, a chemical change, um, you having the burning of uh, gasoline, that's a potential to kinetic change instead because you have the potential energy of the chemical bonds which then you're changing to kinetic energy with the burning process you're turning liquid into gas but you're doing it in a chemical way not a physical way um, so then that's a chemical change um, frying bacon um, you're using the heat to fry um, so then that's a kinetic to potential change because um, you're putting heat in and you're increasing its potential energy. It, it can do more work now that it's bacon versus being just slices of ham because um, you put energy into it. Um, so then uh, you have that kinetic change to potential change. I'm just getting energy out of it. So then the answer is um, burning gasoline is this change from uh, more potential down to uh, kinetic that 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 change in energy from more of a potential energy down to more kinetic energy all right 14 uh, was another one that f uh, not enough folks got right so uh, if you get that one wrong I did give you credit for that one um, so the idea there is which uh, illustrates a potential energy so that is uh, a potential energy is the increased ability to do work so that's what this over here says an increased ability to do work so when you look at these when a firecracker explodes you're increasing the kinetic energy because it's a reaction um, so that's not an increase in potential uh, you're winding up a toy you're doing um, a wind up toy is winding down so it's doing less work so when it's doing less work as it winds down um, that is not an increase in potential energy um, the apple dropping from the tree you're going from a higher state to a lower state in the height um, so therefore that is not an increase in potential energy the reverse is so only one of these uh, a person climbing a set of stairs because they can fall farther so as they each step they go up they have more of a potential to do work because they can fall farther so that's an increased ability to do work um, is what that means so that's the answer there is because they can do more work um, so once again no one got that one wrong because not enough people got it right so um, in the reaction and 15 you have this reactant you have the reactants on this side uh, the products on this side uh, so then the products are um, then that side of the reaction well we got a little B there uh, 16 uh, you have um, what pair of formulas illustrates the laws of multiple proportions um, that got a little skewed there but that uh, definition there of laws of multiple proportions says that an atom of two or more elements combine in different ratios so you have atom of two or more elements combine in different ratios so do you have the same uh, elements in just different ratios no because you have chlorine and you don't have chlorine over here. Um, here these are exactly the same, so they're they're not different ratios. Uh, once again, you have the not the same elements. You have chlorine here, you have bromine there, and here you have the same elements, hydrogen and oxygen, in just different ratios. A one to two ratio versus a one to one ratio. So that's that illustrates a lot of multiple proportions. Um, how many types of electrical charges exist? Two, positive and negative. Those are the two electrical charges. Uh, 18 at the distance between particles uh, as the distance between particles with charges that attract one another increases the force of the attraction will decrease quickly remember we said that that distance was extraordinarily important and therefore um, it, that uh, as those two charged particles um, as that uh, distance between them 
uh, increases, we get them farther apart from one another, that force of attraction falls off quickly. So uh, that's important. Uh, what's the relative electric charge of the electron? Electron is uh, minus one. Uh, what's the relative mass of an electron? Electron is teeny tiny. Remember, so that was one of the things I said you had to memorize was the one uh, over uh, 1,837th of an AMU. So the electron is teeny tiny compared to the size of the atom in most cases, your average atom. All right, uh, page 21, uh, page 21, number 21. Uh, we have um, the mass of copper uh, atoms uh, in uh, 1.45 times 10 to the 22nd grams, how many copper atoms are present in that uh, 95 gram sample of copper. So you have uh, 94.5 grams, and that's a little g there, uh, and then you have it, then you know then for every single atom of copper, uh, you have then uh, 1.45 times 10 to the minus 22nd for the grams, the weight. So your grams cancel each other, you're left with atoms, so uh, 94.5 divided by uh, that gets you the uh, <coughs> uh, 9.43 times 10 to the 23rd, which then gets you the, the answer there of 9.04 times 10 to the 23rd as the number of atoms. <coughs> uh, 22, uh, the number of protons in an atom is known as its atomic number. So we have atomic mass, which is the uh, the average. We have the mass number, which is the number of uh, protons and neutrons. And then we have the molecular mass, which is based on then uh, what the what that ratio is of uh, elements to one another. Uh, isotopes um, of different uh, uh, elements are different because they have a different number of neutrons. So. Uh, protons and electrons are the same in isotopes, but neutrons are different. Um, 24, uh, one isotope of oxygen um, has uh, an atomic number of 8, so that's atomic number 8, and has a mass number of 18. Um, so your atom then is your mass number, which is the number of protons and the number of neutrons. Um, your atomic number is the number of protons and the number of electrons, so you then would take uh, that uh, mass number uh, minus the um, atomic number to give you the number of neutrons. So you have 18 minus 8, which is 10 um, neutrons. And so then when you're looking then for uh, what is true, then um, when it says 8 neutrons, nope. Um, 10 uh, electrons, nope, it will be 8. So you have 8 right there. Um, 18 electrons? Nope. It'll be 8. And then so you have then 8 protons. It's tr the only one of these is true. Uh, then uh, number 25. Uh, naturally occurring neon exists as three isotopes. 90.5% um, of 20. 19.99% uh, or 19.9.27% uh, um, is the uh, 21 with a mass of 20.99 9, and then you have 9% of the 22 which has a mass of uh, 21.99 AMUs. So what's the atomic mass of neon? So you take each uh, percentage, here's that 90.51% uh, uh, times its mass that it has uh, as a function of that molecule and then that gives you the amount it contributes uh, to the atomic mass. So then you have the 0.27% um, uh, times its mass and then its contribution and then lastly you have the 9.22% uh, times its mass to give its contribution. Um, you add all those up um, with the uh, 6 getting dropped out for precision. Um, so you have 
20.16, which is approximately equal to then uh, 20.18, which is what the um, answer is. How many protons does a neutral atom of argon-40 have? Uh, argon is number, atomic number 18, so it has 18 uh, protons, as well as 18 electrons, so that's 18. Uh, <coughs> average mass of one atom of carbon <coughs> is at 2 times 10 to the minus 23rd grams. How many carbon atoms are present in the 40 gram sample? Once again, you have 40 grams of carbon, and you know that there is uh, 2 times 10 to 23rd grams per carbon atom, uh, then your grams are going to disappear. You're left with atoms, so then you have 40 divided by the 2 um, times 10 to the minus 23rd, so then your answer is um, 2.000 times 10 to 24th, um, so then the answer is 10 with the three significant figures, 2.00 times 10 to the 24th atoms. Letter C. 28. You have uh, the element with atomic number 53. Um, also contains, and here I have those listed. So 53 means 53 protons, 53 electrons, and then uh, 73 neutrons. Uh, then when you look at these, um, then only one of those is true, uh, which is the 53 protons. Uh, sulfur uh, occurs naturally in those four isotopes. Uh, sulfur 32, uh, sulfur, uh, sulfur 32 with 31.97 to 1, sulfur 33 with 32.97, sulfur 34 with 33.96, and sulfur 36 with 35.39. So based on this information given on the periodic table, what's the atomic, uh, which isotope is the most abundant? And so your periodic table tells you that the atomic mass of sulfur is uh, 32.07, um, which is uh, relative to the weighted average of those isotopes. So um, by its weight, then, the abundance, then, is going to be the one that is the closest to that atomic mass. So the one of these uh, that is the closest to 32.07 is sulfur 32 because 31.97 is the closest to 32.07 of these options. So the answer then is A, 31 points, uh, sulfur 32 because it has an atomic mass that is closest to the average atomic mass from the periodic table. Uh, distance between uh, consecutive wave peaks, um, what is that? Uh, frequency is the number of peaks per given amount of time. Uh, amplitude is the height of the peak compared to the average line that kind of tells you the height. So then wavelength is the distance between the average peaks. So that's uh, the answer there. Uh, lowest possible ground state for an electron is known as its, uh, lowest, it's called its ground state. Um, excited state is not the ground, so basement doesn't actually exist. And then low state is, is we don't really use that either. Uh, 32, um, you have um, the uh, excited states, you have the bright line spectrum of an, of an uh, element. Uh, what produces that bright line spectrum and so um, energy goes into the process so the, el the electron is at this level one energy goes in um, to that process uh, pushes that electron up to that higher level state so then when that electron then falls back down again um, energy comes off of it uh, as a photon and so the photon of light is given off when it comes back down so that f that process of that electron falling back down from that excited state gives off the photon, which gives you that light. That photon of light then gives you that bright line spectrum. Um, and when you have many of those going at different levels, each kind of different electron going at different kinds of energy levels, you get a different kind of light photon for each time that electron comes back down or the, the the variety of electrons come back down from one state to the other giving you different bright lines that show up 
of this particular amount of photonic energy, that quanta of energy. Uh, 33, how many orbitals uh, are contained in the 2p sublevel? Any p sublevel has three electrons, three orbitals, and then so therefore can hold six electrons. So it doesn't matter which p it is, um, they all have um, that three um, boxes, basically, that you fill. Um, what's the maximum number of electrons that can occupy any orbital? Any orbital is two. No matter what the orbital is, no matter what sublevel it's in, each orbital can occupy two electrons. Uh, atoms of which element uh, have the following configuration? So you have uh, two plus two plus three electrons. So three and two is five and two is seven so you have seven electrons to deal with so which element has seven electrons that would be nitrogen it has seven electrons all right number 36 uh, what's the configuration uh, of this particular so what's the total number of electrons in the second principal energy level uh, of nitrogen and so uh, in its ground state so when you take a look at the actual configuration of nitrogen, you have 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. So that's the configuration of all of the electrons, all seven of them. So when you look at just the second principal energy level, uh, it's then the five that are there. And those are its valence electrons. So that's the five. Uh, 37, uh, how many valence electrons are present in the element with the following configuration once again? Uh, we're using the same element here uh, of nitrogen. Uh, once again, this is the total configuration. The valence electrons are the ones that are on the highest principal energy level. Uh, so that's going to be five in this case. Once again, that's those same five electrons are the valence electrons. On the periodic table, uh, elements that have similar manner are found in the same what? So similar manner, similar chemical properties, uh, a series is another name for a row. Um, a cohort is not a chemical name, so that doesn't work. Uh, a period is another name for a row. Uh, the only thing that has similar properties are columns or families or groups. So those are the things that have similar chemical properties. A group, which is sometimes called the family, which is a column on the periodic table. Up and down. They have the same valence electrons, hence the same chemical property. Uh, the electron configuration of neon uh, plus then the 3s2, um, 3, 3p4, so how many electrons is that? How many? So then you have neon, uh, which is uh, 12, neon is uh, neon's 10, so you have 10 uh, plus these 2 is 12, plus those 4 is 16, so we have 16. So which uh, particular element is element uh, number 16? And that is sulfur, is element number 16. So uh, with the ground state of the electron configuration for carbon, so carbon has 6 electrons. So when you put those six electrons into the into the state, then uh, you then have two, uh, and then four, which fill first, and then two more and make six. So that's why B is the answer there. So choose uh, the electron diagram that has uh, the correct uh, diagram for arsenic. And so we have arsenic, which has 33 electrons. Um, it is in the third column. Uh, on the periodic table. And so then uh, when you look at the uh, orbitals going across, um, you have the 1s2, 2s2, uh, 2p, and then 3s2, and then 3p, uh, 4s. Um, this is not filled, so that can't be right. Uh, 3d. And then you then have to then look and see what happens with the p orbitals. Uh, 
but the Pauli exclusion principle we talked about before, saying that basically you have to go in one at a time before you go back and spin pair. And so since there's only three electrons um, in that orbital, um, then that tells you then this is the correct answer uh, because uh, that has three in, the, in that outside orbital. This is the only other possibility, and this is wrong because it's spun pair before it filled one each. All right, uh, 42. That didn't scan so well, uh, but uh, that is going to be. I uh, want to know which what orbital has that circular shape. Uh, that circular shape. Look, a sphere is the s orbital. Uh, 43. Um, you have uh, this is one of the three P's. Remember we have that P orbital looking like a dumbbell shape in all three directions in the X, Y, and Z axis. This is, happens to be one of the, the P orbitals. Uh, 44, what shape is this drawn? Um, you basically have these two uh, unbonded pairs uh, that will bend this molecule down so you have these two that are bending back through the paper um, while this one is in line with the paper this is coming out towards you and so you have that bent uh, shape and that's what water looks like is that bent shape so that's the bent shape there um, uh, 45 um, has a molecular shape there um, when you have those three atoms um, that are all around a central atom uh, and so to get them the farthest apart um, you can they can stay in the same plane that will keep them the, 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 the farthest apart they're basically all in the flat they're all on the plane of, of the of the paper so that's a triangular shape all in the plane of the paper therefore uh, a triangular planar shape um, uh, we, this was talked about in the book several times, but uh, evidently not enough folks got that uh, idea from the book. So we know people got this one right to cut this one count. Um, so that 109 is the angle uh, between any two bonded electrons going through that central electron. Um, so that is the correct answer. Well, once again, no one, none of the people got that one right to count it against everybody. So uh, we're going to give that one to you. Uh, 47 is the um, Lewis dot structure uh, for uh, water and so when you start out uh, with the first shape for water uh, basically you have water that's bonded to one another um, so then therefore um, when you count those you have uh, with one bond you have two uh, and then four six on that one and here you have two four six eight so that won't work because uh, there's not enough sharing there um, you can also uh, have a situation where one of the electrons would come over so you saw that single bond but then you have the rest of the electrons around so you have two uh, four six seven not enough two for the bond four six seven not enough so that one's not going to work uh, and then you have the bond situation where you have a double bond we have two four and then six eight and that works uh, and then you have uh, two four and six and eight uh, and that works so that works well and if you have a triple bond you have two four six uh, eight and then you have nine so that's too many so that's why that one does not work because uh, there's too many electrons there It's because you want that octet so that's why only this one will work so the uh, best uh, Lewis dot structure here for this particular one um, once again we have uh, for nitrogen in the center we have two four uh, six eight ten electrons for nitrogen the first one that won't happen that doesn't work um, once again for nitrogen we have two four and six electrons in the center uh, that won't work not enough uh, on the bottom for oxygen 
Uh, we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. 10 for oxygen. Uh, that won't work. So the only one that does work is this one, uh, where you have um, 2, 4, 6, and 8 for oxygen. Um, you have uh, 2, 4, 6, and 8. And then you have, for nitrogen, 2, 4, 6, and 8. So everybody has 8. Everybody's happy. Uh, we have, uh, as one progresses from left to right across a periodic table, atomic radius generally, because you have the higher charge at the same distance, since distance is the same, it's not, it cannot overwhelm that charge difference. So as you have the higher charge, it pulls those electrons in, and therefore that gets smaller. Because here the charge is much more important than distance because they're at the same distance. Uh, atoms of metals generally will form ions by losing the electron and forming the positive anion. Because they want to lose a little bit of an electron, a couple electrons, to get that double gas configuration instead of gaining a, a bunch more electrons. So how many valence electrons are present in bromine? And it's uh, ground state. So bromine is in column 7 uh, at element number 35. So if we account for all of the uh, the electrons that are on there, we go through and create that uh, that electron configuration. Um, then we know that in that fifth energy, in that fourth energy level, the 4s2 and the 4p5 it happens to have then 7, 2 plus 5 is 7 in those valence electrons. So that's why 7 is the answer. It also has to be in the 7th column. But that's just a function of how many electrons it has. Uh, 52 uh, was the total number of electrons present in the O2 minus ion. So oxygen is element number 8. The neutral atom um, has eight electrons. Uh, you add an ion which is at a negative two, you give two more electrons, so you have then a total of ten electrons uh, that are now in that ion. And that was the, that was letter B there. 53. Uh, what's the empirical formula of calcium oxide? Uh, calcium is plus two, uh, oxygen is minus 2, uh, neutral, CaCO, therefore that's the answer. Uh, what type of chemical bond involves an unequal sharing of electrons? Unequal sharing. And so uh, we have uh, ionic bonds where the electrons are taken or they move from one to the other. We have covalent where the bonds are more or less equally shared. And then in the center between those two, we have polar covalent, which is the unequal sharing of electrons. So that's why it's letter B there. Um, 55, which does not have a noble gas configuration. So SC plus 3. Uh, SC is uh, argon plus uh, 4S2. 3d1. So when you lose those three uh, valence electrons, those three outer shell electrons, you get then that uh, noble gas configuration of argon. Argon is a noble gas, so it has its own electron configuration. Uh, oxygen at a minus two uh, would have uh, the helium uh, plus um, 4s2. I'm sorry, uh, 2s2, 2p4. Um, so then if um, you have, uh, you get rid of uh, those two electrons, um, helium uh, 6, I mean, you, get, you add two electrons. You go from uh, 2p6, from 2p4 to 2p6, uh, helium 2s2, 2p6 is neon. That's that noble gas configuration. So that is a noble gas configuration. And then uh, potassium um, is argon uh, plus a 4s1. 
and if it's just naturally there then that is one that does not have only the noble gas configuration it has noble gas plus 4s1 so that is the answer of the only one that does not have noble gas all right that was a review of uh, exam number two